This is the first one in this fall semester. Cancellation. Uh, thanks again for coming. I'm Bruce Maxwell. I'm the AG Director of the Institute of Ethical Systems. And today we have Anna Blair with us. She's an assistant professor in the science department. And uh, she didn't give me much else about her other than the fact that she studies volcanoes. And she's going to tell us about our backyard volcano. And uh, it sounds like you're doing really interesting things with students. Hopefully. Taking students to the Philippines to see um, a big volcano in the, in the past. And so uh, I'm just going to let you take a look from here. So well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Madison Myers. I'm in the Department of Earth Sciences. I've been here. This is my second year. And today I'm going to kind of just give a very general overview of uh, why Yellowstone is so cool, some of the challenges of working in Yellowstone, using it as a teaching lab and research lab, um, but also the, the challenge of science communication associated with it, and a little on how it's monitored. Ooh. Man, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything else. Ah, okay. Um, is there... I'll get this away. Okay, so I, well, yeah. luckily I have an announcement to begin with. I was uh, searched out on, online and found that I was giving this talk. So um, as many of you may or may not know, this upcoming May, uh, we are co-hosting along with um, the park, the Biennial Science Conference. It's the 15th annual on the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. It's gonna be held May 4th through 6th at the Mammoth Hotel with an opening reception and lecture on Sunday, May 3rd. The theme of the conference is focus on the geosciences, where presentations and posters are supposed to be drawing from a very integrated field of volcanology, geology, geobiology, geohydrology, geohazards, lots, lot, and it keeps going, lots of good things. Uh, so the idea is that there's registration and call for abstracts that will be open in February. This should be being sent out in your email, I think today. Um, oh wow, look at that, I'm like barely ahead of the game. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring your attention to this. It's actually occurring at the same exact time as the volcano monitoring meeting, so there will be a little bit of overlap, uh, although the monitoring meeting is really to figure out some other logistics. So a little bit about myself. Um, as I was introduced, I'm a volcanologist. Most of my interests are all of them really focused around volcanoes. Specifically, the questions that I'm trying to ask in my research are where magma is stored in the crust, what triggers it to move and mobilize towards the surface? How long do these processes take? And then how do we record these processes? Which largely comes down to trying to investigate them from the volcanic deposits that are left over and kind of the snapshots of all of these questions. My other interest, as was kind of alluded to, really has to do with education and using the outdoors and volcanoes to get students engaged in research and projects, asking questions. And so this is just an example from GeoGirls, which is this awesome uh, middle school program that's all women in Mount St. Helens. You can volunteer for it as a graduate student. So think about it if you're a lady. It's a pretty awesome program. All right, but since being here, of course, one of the things that's inevitable about being a volcanologist in Bozeman is the first question you get almost any time you go anywhere is when is the next super eruption going to be? Or when am I going to die in a fiery death? Um, so it's kind of inevitable that I had to figure out how to answer this question, which is a really challenging one and requires you to be very cautious and careful with how you word things and talk people through um, the science of what is this awesome volcano that also created some of the largest eruptions on Earth. On the other side, it's awesome for us to bring students. So last year in June, I took a bunch of students to Yellowstone and we talked through processes, some of the research that I've done. We went through what different volcanic products looked like and they were able to, outside of the park, collect rocks and look at samples. And, um, and it was really a great teaching experience and having that here and being able to bring students there is a huge advantage and kind of outweighs the doomsday scenario questions that I get. <laughs> And of course, the other wonderful thing about Yellowstone is that it's beautiful and it's also iconic. People know about it. So when I go to international meetings and I say, I'm from Montana, people are like, I have no idea where Montana is. But if I say I live outside of Yellowstone, people's faces light up and they're so excited and they want to visit. 
And so I think that part of living here and what I do is just awesome because it's not hard to sell people on Yellowstone and why it's so interesting and cool. So just to get us all on the same page, even though most of this is probably in a brochure, you all have at home. So Yellowstone National Park is the first national park. It's going to have its 150th birthday in just two years, so something to look forward to. It's a massive area, so over 9,000 square kilometers or 2.2 million acres. It has over half of the world's hydrothermal features, making it a playground for people that study hydrothermal features. Really, some of the only other places that compare are things like Iceland or New Zealand. And so that's truly remarkable. It also has about 1,000 to 3,000 earthquakes annually, which is a crazy amount. And also, part of the, the challenge with communicating the science is that we have to monitor this system. We have to understand what these earthquakes mean and how to explain these to the public. And then what I love the most about it, potentially, maybe, is that it, it's also home to one of the world's largest calderas. It's had three eruptions that have produced calderas. And before I keep using that word, let's go over what a caldera is. So in a volcanic eruption, you tend to have, when we think about it, some massive blob of magma at depth. You then have maybe a central vent that erupts into a nice plume. And in a caldera forming eruption, really the only difference between the other eruption you see is that enough material is evacuated from that chamber area that it actually depressurizes the whole system and the roof falls down, kind of like a piston falling as you evacuate a liquid into the surface. This then makes it kind of one of the more challenging volcanoes to actually see and pinpoint because it's usually very flat. And so something like Crater Lake or Bias Caldera or Yellowstone, you can't just point to you, maybe your, your grandmother, your mom, and say that is a volcano. It looks a little different, and they're harder to actually be able to, to pinpoint visually. So Yellowstone has had three major caldera forming eruptions, and you will not um, believe, but when I went to the park last year with students, I realized that it's actually more caldera forming eruptions. They were just teeny in comparison. So the volumes that we're talking about here are in the order of thousands of cubic kilometers. So the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, which is the oldest of the three, it kind of formed what is now the Yellowstone Volcanic Field, erupted 2,500 cubic kilometers of material, making it one of the largest eruptions on Earth. Really the only ones that are larger, there's like two, and it's very hard to constrain the volumes, but they might be twice as big. So that's, that's what we know. But of course, this place is interesting in that um, 1.3 million years, we had another large valve eruption. This was on the order of around 500 cubic kilometers, so a baby in comparison. And then the Lava Creek Tuff is the eruption that made what we see now as the caldera. So when you go into Yellowstone and you see what you think might be a, a caldera, that is the Lava Creek Tuff, which um, in place about 1,000 cubic kilometers. <laughs> And so when I mentioned that it's challenging, I spend a lot of time in Yellowstone and I feel like half the time I have no idea where the call there is. There's a lot of trees, there's bison, there's bison jam. And so the best I've ever been convinced is driving down from Norris to Madison and stopping, stopping at Gibbon Falls. And so when you stop at Gibbon Falls and you walk down to the edge, you actually can look out into the distance into all those trees and see that it's actually flatter and expansive and that you had to drop down significantly to get there. And when you get back in your car, you then start driving down towards Madison and you go down a pretty substantial decline. That's the caldera boundary. That's part of the Lava Creek Tops boundary. And so that's kind of the scale that we're talking about when we think of these caldera systems. But importantly, and this is again going back to science communication, most of the eruptions that happen in Yellowstone are kind of minor rhyolitic and basaltic lava flows that occur in between these major eruptions. With the most recent, so the most recent activity in Yellowstone is 70,000 years ago, with a, a rhyolitic flow that has such a high viscosity, so sluggish, that it just crawls out of the system. So if people ask you what's the most likely thing, when's the next super eruption going to die, the most likely thing that happened is that we're going to have a lava flow. And it's going to be still very scary because it would occur in Yellowstone, and that would be very hard to compete with. But it would also be very, very slow. So there would likely be very little damage to people, just ecosystems. So, sorry, ecosystem people. 
<laughs> but interesting to study. Um, so when I talk about uh, logging flows, here's an example of some columnar basalt. So these columns that you see, these tend to form in lava flows, and, and you kind of then pinpoint them when you're in either the columnar river basalts or in Yellowstone as an example of this more effusive, gentler kind of eruption style. Here's an example from the air. So again, here's the rim, meaning just a drop off in a flat area. So this is looking kind of north the opposite way. And here we see, and you'll likely see this as you're driving around the thermal areas, these like lobes of material. All of those are rhyolitic lava flows that kind of have filled in into the caldera. And they're the most prevalent type of volcanism that we see in Yellowstone. Here's just an overview of the um, Yellowstone Park. And so in the outline here, there's three outlines. These are the outlines of the caldera forming eruption. So again, the one that I've been kind of highlighting is the Lava Creek. That's the one that we can actually see. We have a pretty good understanding of where some of this boundary is. The, the next oldest is the Mesa Falls. So you can see how teeny it is. Um, so this is over in Island Park. It's actually not at all within the park. But it's actually a very easy one to see as well if you bring students over here. Very, um, very flat and um, pronounced. And then the hardest probably to see and where we have the most error is the Huckleberry Ridge, which is this massive caldera forming eruption, the oldest one, that has an outline that goes all the way into Yellowstone Lake and around. And we're less vague, we're more vague on, on what this looks like. Importantly to note on this, everything in pink here. These are those lava flows. So you can see how much it's really filled in the area and just how prevalent these are in the region. All right, so I'm gonna go into a little more on what my research is and what we're doing in our lab group here at Montana State. But to get there, we need to go over some, well, chronology 101. So typically when you have an explosive volcanic eruption, you start with a main plume. And so these are the plumes that go in the air. They make the beautiful photographs that you might have seen with volcanic lightning in them. But also, a lot of times, if you have enough volume coming out, you tend to also have these ground hugging flows. And these are called ignimbrite eruptions. And these are extremely hot, very fast moving. They don't have the, the aerial extent or the extent that a, a plume does, but they're much more damaging especially when they start to mix with things like water or snow melt, then you're going to get things called lahars, which have um, really devastating effects on the ecosystem, as an example from this photo here of Mount St. Helens. So in Yellowstone, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. I just went cross country skiing and I skied down this road mm -hmm. and I was like, I never get to stop and look at this rock because it's always like this, it's horrifying, I hate it. But, um, <laughs> This is the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. So these are two different ignimbrites that came out, meaning those ground hugging flows. But in Yellowstone, material is so hot that when it comes out, it actually starts to weld together and fuse all of the little particles. And so it makes it really dense and very tough. And so it kind of starts to look like lava in many ways. But this is actually an ignimbrite deposit from the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. The other thing to note about Yellowstone is that these ash falls, so the plume that went up, has amazing extents. So how many of you in here might have Mount St. Helens out? <laughs> any of you? A few of you. So Mount St. Helens went interrupted. The wind direction was uh, from the west to the east, and so the ash actually made it all the way over into Montana. And there's some pretty spectacular photographs when I lived in Moscow, Idaho, of the ash hole that it had hit in that area. And so if you look at where the projections are for the Lava Creek Tuff and for the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, you see that essentially almost the entire continent would be covered in ash. So again, the ash fall, depending on where you live, is not going to be very extensive. It probably will not cause significant damage in the case of a super eruption, unless you live close by. I'll show you that projection later on in the talk. But it has this amazing extent really wide, a lot of people would see this, and this is the type of thing that then causes climate change. So these are the effects where all of this ash and particulate into the air and all the gases that would be released are what would have effects on climate in the long term. And here's what a, a fall deposit looks like. And most of my research involves fall deposits. 
And so the very base layer, you see that you can see a lot of layering. It looks very pretty and sorted and like you could just kind of go up there and scoop the material out. And so that is a really rapid quench because this material is flying into the air. It's um, reacting with that air and cooling super quickly. And it preserves information on things like the time scales of magma ascent. And so that becomes really interesting for my research. This, unfortunately, is probably one of the most beautiful outcrops of the Mesa Falls Tuff. And so when I was trying to get a student to help me find where this was, it's now a housing development. So it no longer exists. I'm a real bummer. I think one of the most impressive things about Yellowstone is when we start to think about scale, which is really hard to do. It's kind of like thinking about geological time. And so one of the best ways people have started to do this is by these fun little box diagrams. And so Mount St. Helens is an eruption most people can visualize and understand the effects of. And so when we look at Mount St. Helens with its teeny plume here or its teeny box, and then we go up to looking at a Yellowstone eruption, and this is the Lava Creek, which is in the United States, the Huckleberry, we see that Yellowstone is extremely unique. It has produced these really, really large eruptions multiple times which is hard to do. You have to build up a lot of magma within the crust. But it really shows you just kind of the scale of how this thing would affect global climate or global people or anything if we were around at that time. And the kind of what I'm trying to emphasize here is that as volcanologists, a lot of our understanding comes from the ability to be able to look at these eruptions, monitor them, see what happens, and then learn from that. But most of that information has really come from smaller volume eruptions. So this is an example from Calbuca, Chile. It's um, a beautiful eruption. It, like, just by chance, the BBC was there and they filmed it and it was like the most beautiful um, views of this eruption. And this is, it's beautiful, but it's also scary. If you live at the base of this, this is a big eruption. This is going to displace you from your home. But this is less than a cubic kilometer of material. So this is smaller than Mount St. Helens. And so we can learn from this. We can say, okay, well, this is the type of seismicity we saw before this, or this is what the ground was doing before this. And then we can use that to inform how we then monitor other volcanoes of similar size that produce similar eruption. The challenge is, and where a lot of my research has focused on, is how do we extrapolate this to larger eruptions that we've never observed? that we have no idea the time scales over which they occur. And so a lot of the literature kind of unfortunately uh, assumes that kind of you just scale it up, that the same processes might be happening and you just like it's bigger. And so we often envision this as, you know, you have a central that eruption, enough of it comes out, you just continue to pour it out until it collapses and that's what happens all there for the eruption. It's, it's in many ways, people have thought of these as very quick processes. This could occur in maybe several days. And so in some ways that makes these things scarier to think about that this much material could come out that quickly. But what if there were eruptive pauses? What if the eruption stopped? And so that's one of the biggest challenges when you're studying deposits. So for instance, we always use an example. Mount St. Helens had its climatic eruption in 1980. And then there was some activity later in the 80s that were just small domes. And then in the early 2000s, it also had some small dome eruptions. If you imagine taking from 80 to 2010, which is 30 years, and then putting it back 2 million years, how would you be able to tell that that wasn't one eruptive episode? And so, you know, you might call that one eruptive episode in the long history, but for people that live at Mount St. Helens, that was multiple separate episodes of activity. And so really our question is, how do we start to tease apart using the field these kind of time breaks or, or recognizing them? Because that's really going to change how we monitor these systems. What if there's multiple magma bodies or multiple vents active at the time? What if there was a vent in Cook City at the same time as something in West Yellowstone? That would really change how we viewed the Yellowstone system. And so a lot of what we do is focus on what evidence can we use in the field based on field work or based on actually using geochemistry to recognize and quantify these kind of complications or information from, from the geological products. And so in my group, 
we mostly use minerals and rocks to investigate these questions. And so we'll take single mesopumis clasts or single sample of material from that ball deposit, and we'll look for minerals. I mostly use quartz because quartz has no cleavage for those of you that are geo nerds. And so it preserves information on what I'm interested in a little bit better. And so most of what I do and my group is doing is looking at what this is a melting region. And so this is a little blob of melt that um, is essentially what this crystal was forming in. And as it grows, as it grows, it sometimes grows imperfectly. So it has imperfections in it. It sometimes grows quicker in some places than others. And so this is an example of an olivine crystal. And you can see that it's kind of like, like grabbing and snapping a little snapshot of that melt. And so that melt can tell us things about the temperature and pressure of where this magma was sitting. It can tell us the composition, which allows us to understand the sources of where, this, um, where these melts are coming from. And putting that together, we can start to build a story of how things were situated within the crust. So largely chemistry in the form of geochemistry can allow us to put together some of the information of how this material came to be and where it was situated in the crust. And um, hopefully I'll emphasize as to why that's important. Other things that we can use are based on field work. And so I'm going to just show an example from the Huckleberry Ridge top that probably a lot of the eruptions in Yellowstone did start to um, tease apart. But the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff was the map in the 1970s and was thought to be this one unit of material. So 2,500 cubic kilometers that came out in one major eruption. However, a colleague of mine um, who is my PhD co-advisor, Colin Wilson, has been working in the park for about 20 years. And for some reason, this photo rotated. So <laughs> principle of horizontality is not being applied here. But up is this way. And so what we can see in the initial fall deposit of this eruption is that you have rain and wind interaction, suggesting that the plume started and stopped multiple times. Not for very long. You don't need very long for a weather to affect deposition, but maybe days. And so putting that together and seeing this throughout the park, Collins inferred that this could be several weeks of an initial fall deposit. So all of a sudden, we now have a lot of time just being preserved in this very opening phase of the major eruption. It's, although it's massive, so this was estimated to be about 50 cubic kilometers, it's a lot smaller than the 2,500, and really changes our time frame for thinking about this eruption. Oh, bummer, man. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just describe it. So there's other um, field evidence that are not going to be shown here. Um, between A and B and B and C, that suggests longer time breaks. So that there's actually cooling boundaries, there's um, deformation, meaning kind of folding happening in some of these units that's not preserved in others. And this suggests that there's time breaks maybe on the order of months between A and B and potentially years between B and C. The challenge is, of course, that field work, even though field geology is like the fundamentals of, of geology, it's really hard to convince people that you are quantifying anything through these observations. It's very qualitative, like no soil development has to be shorter than this, or big soil has to be longer than this. It's not easy to convince people that these cooling breaks equal 30 or 60 years. So you have to find other ways of doing that. And so one technique that we've used to start looking at how these things are situated in the time frame of things I'm too distracting from the walking. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Is to look at, so this is an example from my research, which is on melt inclusions again. So, so here's one of those blobs of melt. This blob of melt, as Mary learned yesterday, is called um, a reentrant or embayment. It's open to the surrounding and actually records, records changes that are occurring in the surrounding. And so we use these and went through this initial fall deposit and try to look at how the chemistry was changing and the time scales of this emplacement using diffusion related tools. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, you know, scatter plots are no one's favorite. But really what I want to emphasize is that there's clustering occurring in the Huckleberry Ridge top like nobody's business. And so what these clusters mean in these groups means is that magma was separated from each other. 
And we see these clusters even within these reentrants, suggesting that they were always separate from each other, even upon eruption. They weren't an integrated body of magma. They were separate melt lenses. And so that brought us to this idea that this eruption had separate bodies that were tapped at different times. As we went through this fall deposit, we saw that the composition changed as we went up it. And so we infer that to suggest that there was a vent that was active, that then maybe was active with another one, again, separate composition, so they had to be tapped from separate areas within Yellowstone. And kind of the idea is, is that this is not an integrated body. So we're starting to get an idea of, okay, what did the beginning of this eruption look like? And what I didn't go through here, and it's, it's more detail, but we started to apply speedometers, meaning how quickly did magma ascend to the surface? using volatiles, which are, in this case, water and CO2 is dissolved in the melt. And then um, during ascent, they will form little gas bubbles, which then makes the eruption <laughs> explode. But you can record this information and actually figure out how quickly material came to the surface. And so we looked at that to try to start to quantify time. And so even though most times if you ask anyone to draw a volcano, they're gonna draw a giant circle and they're gonna draw this initial eruption, we start to think, okay, well, maybe there's actually separation that is being preserved within the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. And so my colleague, Elliot Swallow, for his PhD, he went into the igneum brain, which is very exciting. So he went around the whole part of Yellowstone, took samples of the base igneum right, so that deposit that occurred right after the fall deposit. And he also sees clustering suggesting that this was a, a, a effect that was observed even deeper into the system, that as that ambrite started tapping, all these small pods of melt were being kind of tapped, suggesting something that I've called kind of the tiramisu model, uh, <laughs> where you have melt in these separate lenses through, with crystals all surrounding them, and that as you start to tap it, you might bring other lenses with you, or in our case on Huckleberry, we actually think that there's separate vents that are happening and they're tapping different composition. Which the implications of this is that our understanding of how melt is stored and how stable it is, is very different in this scenario versus that upper scenario. This is a much more stable configuration for how melt can be stored. And more and more people are going to this idea that these large bodies of melt, because we always think like we need a lot of melt, so just like put it all down there, are actually stored probably in a much more complicated system. And that then we have to figure out how you start to connect these and how you then trigger them to erupt. But this allows us by separating all this melt to build these large bodies and to keep them stable for longer. So the next technique that um, I've done less of, but other groups have done, and it's um, an interesting story from Lava Creek Cup, is to look at pinacris. So this is, again, quartz, <laughs> makes it seem like quartz is the best, but there's other good minerals. But the idea is that as minerals grow in their melt, they record changes, changes in temperature, pressure, composition. And you can actually then look at these changes. And here we see this kind of like flat line that then increases. So I don't see there's like a step function right there. So you can actually do this with a bunch of crystals. And you can then diffusion model them, meaning how long would it take to make the profile that I measured? And with that, get a time. So how much time was it between this growth and this crystal erupting? And so a lot of people then infer that that represents a change in the system, new magma coming into the system, a heating event. And so this then led to this story in the Lava Creek. That line up there that you this is just grayscale. So one of, um, oh, oh, this nice. is just a grayscale value you can use uh, for programs. No, but here this is chemical. Thank you, uh, Colin. So here's strontium and barium. And so this is from a sanidine, so it's a different mineral, but the same premise as in, all, um, in quartz, this is gonna be titanium. And so these profiles that you see in these minerals are kind of this new thing that people are doing to apply time to crystals. So the, the crystal is recording some kind of ramping up or mingling together prior to eruption that tells us about the time at which these eruptions might be triggered. And so then this was a paper, it just came out last year, called Decadal Transition from Quintins to Super Eruption. You may have seen it in more of a, a violent title, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, no, wait, right here. 
So you might have seen it in the news as like, nasty surprise, only decades to prepare for an eruption, which um, my poem even said that one newspaper went as so far to say like, 2042, it's going to erupt. <laughs> and so this is the challenge with, again, I'm going back to the idea of it's a challenge of doing research. This is not something that has not been observed other places. People are finding in silicic systems and these large volume systems that these short time scales are preserved often prior to eruption. And that makes sense, like something has to trigger it to eruption, likely it's heat and new material coming into the system. The crystals are recording it. And so people see this in Santorini, in New Zealand, in the Bishop Cup, that on the order of decades to maybe a hundred years, that these systems are being brought to the final brief, um, essentially their pushing point, the tipping over point where they then erupt. The challenge, of course, with Yellowstone is that it gets picked up by the news, goes through this crazy game of telephone, and by the end, they're predicting the next super eruption, and scientists are hiding it from them. And so it, it really requires us to be cautious to be able to explain these things well. And so essentially, in this study, what they found was that the Lava Creek Cup has timescales on the order of decades prior to when it erupted. And so it seems like a very fast assembly. So, this then leads us to the idea that we have melt underneath this um, volcano. And so, of course, because of the fact that we still have a lot of melt underneath this volcano, we need to be able to monitor it. And so, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, I'm just going to go into a little about the monitoring before I go into some of the projects that we're working on now. So, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is not actually a physical place. It's a consortium of different groups that monitor the volcano to see what's happening here so we can communicate this with the public, to tell them that it's not going to erupt in 2042. So uh, it's made up of all of these organizations, including the USGS, National Park Service, a couple of universities, the Utah and Wyoming, and a few geological surveys. Who's missing from the list? Montana State? So this year, we're finally officially becoming part of the Elsa Volcano Observatory. <laughs> so all of us get to monitor it now, <laughs> not all of us. Um, but the idea is that this is a consortium of people that bring different skill sets in. Some of the, the strongest are probably the University of Utah, who's in charge of all the seismic and monitoring of Yellowstone. But all of us are kind of bringing in our parts and, and helping to understand what's happening in Yellowstone. And so there's a lot of different ways that we monitor Yellowstone. Uh, some involve gas measurements. So when you see changes in gas chemistry, this can tell you something about what's happening at depth. GPS and tilt meter deformation. This actually allows us to see that Yellowstone's breathing but on like a pretty remarkable like rate and time scale. The Utah, so the seismics, and then some satellite imagery that allows us to see things like new geothermal areas that develop within 20 years. So for gas monitoring, a lot of this involves going out with instruments and looking at changes within the system. I know there's probably people in this room that have been a part of that or are interested in that because it can also have effects on the, the type of bio uh, biology that is living within hydrothermal centers. But for volcanology, really the things you're interested in are changes in CO2, which suggest recharge from depth. And actually one of the things I think is so interesting is that Yellowstone has the same CO2 flux as Hawaii. So a lot of basaltic material coming into the system. Uh, and also things like helium, which is again, a signature of that deep mantle melts. And so by looking at where it's coming, you can get an idea of how much is fluxing into the system. How much are we building more melt within our system? Deformation, I think this is really quite neat. So this is a deformation map, and this is just rates and change in millimeters, going up to about 27 millimeters in red. And so, it's actually a lot of deformation that occurs within Yellowstone. It's not all up, sometimes it's down, which is, here's an interesting example, where it's going up on the north side part and down on the south side of the part. And every year this is changing. You can have up years, so you can have a lot of uplift over the course of several years, and then you can have it go down over time. Seismically, so there's a lot of seismic stations. I think Yellowstone's actually one of the best monitored volcanoes in the United States. Um, because of the fact that there's so many earthquakes, people are very concerned about it, even though it's the least likely probably in the radar to erupt, has a lot of fear factor. And so it's very well monitored, um, which allows us to understand a lot about what's happening internally. So here's just an example of some of the earthquakes. So 
again, one to 3,000 per year. The largest, many of you probably know, the Hebgen Lake one in 1959 was 97.5. There was also a 6.1 in 1975. But most of these are lower than a magnitude three. So they're very small and, um, and, and not very concerning and not surprising when we look at the structural map of Yellowstone. And so here what we see are these are just faults that are going through Yellowstone. And so there's a very complicated um, history here, right? You have this major uh, thermal anomaly underneath Yellowstone buoyantly rising, causing a lot of stress on the crust above it. You also have basin and range extension over in the Nevada, Idaho area. And then you're going right against um, kind of this old craton, this old rock that exists in the center of this country. So a lot of room for uh, structural, stress, structural stresses to occur. The other benefit though from all these, um, all these different earthquakes is that it allows us to look at what's happening at depth. And so these are tomography images that allow us to image things and answer questions like how much melt is underneath Yellowstone? Where is it located? How far down does it go? And so from this, we can see that there's a major, obviously, um, anomaly, heat anomaly and uplift in Yellowstone. And when we compare that globally, you see that it's very similar to what you see in Hawaii. And so both of these are considered to be um, deep mantle plumes. Uh, there's a lot of contention around Yellowstone whether it's a deep mantle plume, but the more and more seismic data that we get and the better tomography gets, people are more and more convinced, I would say, that it actually reaches down to quite a substantial depth. So this is in kilometers, suggesting it's going down to like five or 600 kilometers in depth. This is a more recent model for what we think this looks like. And so the group at Utah is kind of constantly updating and refining what this looks like and has suggested things on the order of maybe 10% partial melt currently existing underneath Yellowstone. There are huge error bars on this, especially when you start to think about what I've been trying to emphasize is that this might not just be a giant blob. It might be very discrete bodies that are displaced in a huge regional area. And that's very hard with these techniques to tease out. How much is actually stored in one place? The temperature can be a huge effect on this. And so it makes it challenging to interpret these images, but they're still really powerful for understanding what's happening at depth. Here's a look at the Snake River Plain, and I think it's pretty cool to see that there's still a lot of heat left on the Snake River Plain compared to the Yellowstone Plain. So here, again, this is heat flow. So Yellowstone's quite hot, thermal, lots of input coming in. That's all the thermal hot springs. And, but this also goes back along the Snake River Plain. And so I think this is probably the most convincing argument for a hot spot existing underneath Yellowstone. And that's because the North American plate is moving over this uh, hot spot, it's an aptly name, and uh, leaving this imprint. So going back to 16 million years ago, it's kind of evenly spaced along the Snake River Plain. Each one of these are caldera systems. So all of these are calderas themselves. The volumes are super poorly constrained because there is all this basalt in lava flows that then poured over all of them, making it really hard to understand how big these eruptions were. And then uh, the contentious issue, of course, might be the fact that the, the huge flood basalts are pretty offset from where the track starts. So this is where a lot of the fighting begins. <laughs> so uh, now we have this idea that we have this giant blob that's maybe somewhat separated, a very long root system of melt feeding into the system. And then what I like about this diagram is it really emphasizes that a lot of the earthquakes are really shallow, are in the part of the system with the hydrothermal system, are above that reservoir where all that melt is, and are, are likely more indicative of like water moving through the system and cracking rather than anything associated with the kind of deeper system. So currently, um, just to kind of wrap up on seismic earthquakes, uh, currently this year, I think we're at a little bit of a low around like 1600 earthquakes, but there have been um, swarms that have occurred where you get over 3000 earthquakes really quickly. And so these are what I think start to scare people where you have areas that are more active in terms of hydrothermal energy. And so you can get these swarms that occur. But overall, this is very normal to have these kind of rates of earthquakes and importantly, this allows us to have a really good background level for what a normal year at Yellowstone would look like. 
All right, so the next direction. I'm gonna kind of give some ideas as to how you can communicate with people about why there's not gonna be a steep eruption, or if there was, at least we would know what to look for. So what would we see before a Yellowstone steep eruption? Earthquake swarms, so larger earthquakes with higher intensity than what we currently see. We have a great background level. We've been collecting seismic data for decades. We really understand what a normal looking Yellowstone seismic energy is. Ground deformation focused in the same region. So if you have a lot of melt coming up to the surface, it's going to cause a lot of deformation within a very specific area. And so it's going to focus the uplift within that region. Increased gas emission. So changes in those compositions of things like CO2 and helium to the system and just more gas coming out. So again, that background level is really important for that. And finally, the very end, this is definitely when the park would be closed, would be <laughs> steam explosions and near source of um, seismicity and ground deformation. So this would be when hot things actually started to intersect with the very, very active and prominent geothermal system. One other thing, so the USGS gets this question a lot, right? This is like a constant every day, multiple times a day question. So they actually, back in 2014, decided, what the hell, let's just model what the ash plume would look like. You get an idea of really who would be affected. So this is if you took a lava creek tough eruption, so a thousand cubic kilometers, you give it kind of just a normal wind field for the region, and you pump it out in a, a month-long super eruption. Well, it's fun. This is fun to show people. Okay. <laughs> so essentially, anyone in this blue bullseye is going to get about a meter or more of ash material. So that doesn't include ignimbrae. If you die in big ignimbrae, you know, you, you won't be able to see the ash, I guess. But, <laughs> but essentially, as you go further and further out, by the time you get over to Washington, D.C., you get like one to three millimeters. Not bad. Uh, but essentially, everyone would be very strongly affected. Um, most of the ignimbrites have gone into Idaho, so you can feel good about that up here in Bozeman. They'll probably still go down into Idaho because they follow topography. They go to low points. And so they'll probably, West Yellowstone probably would feel things first. So one thing that I know our department knows about, but I think it's fun to share, is that Caldera Chronicles is now put up by the USGS. It's um, something that everyone can contribute to. So if you work in Yellowstone or your student does or a colleague does, essentially what it is is every Monday they put an article about something happening in Yellowstone, some kind of science just to allow the public to get good information about what is happening in Yellowstone Park. And the advantage of these is that you can take those really challenging topics that you don't really want to talk about with your student and you can just send them a link. So, for instance, last year someone came to interview me about how Yellowstone was overdue and how, like, what, when were we all going to go. And so, Mike Polin, because he gets this question so often, it's like, you cannot say a volcano is overdue. That's not how volcanoes work. They're not a library book. They're not an oil chain. They are complicated things. You cannot predict when they're going to occur. That's why we monitor them so well. And so this is a great resource that I would suggest checking out. You can use for teaching. And specifically, we've even used it on the field trip. I had my students write an article for it about just, they gave them a topic. They were allowed to kind of choose how they went with it, but just to explain from a very new point of view, what is an ignimbrite eruption? What is a caldera? What, what is Yellowstone? And it's then picked up actually by the Casper Star Tribune, which is really cool. So getting the word out to local areas. And just to kind of wrap up here, some of the future directions our group is going in. So this is a project that um, Eric Sproles is actually going to help me work on, but uh, they want to have a new geological map. The last geological map of the whole park was really kind of finished in the 70s and 80s, and the 150th anniversary is coming up. A lot of data has changed. Most importantly, uh, age dating. So in the last 20 or 30 years, our ability to take one of those little minerals and figure out how old it is has really improved. And so we now can take what looks like maybe a massive lava flow, sample it at different points, and realize, oh, this is actually two lava flows, which changes not only the age and how you would draw it on the map, but the volume that you think these things are. And that changes how we view hazards within the area. And so the idea with this project is that we would work strongly with the USGS to, to compile all the information from the literature <laughs> and update what this geological map would look like hopefully in time for the 150th anniversary, but the USGS takes a long time to 
How's this thing? So probably not. <laughs> and um, on that, one of the other things that we're starting is kind of a, a cool project idea. And so essentially the observation was these rocks that were thought to be the Huckleberry Ridge top over here, kind of north of Yellowstone Lake. And this is part of Colin Wilson's work. He walked all over the park finding every Huckleberry Ridge top rock he could find. And so he went over here to something called Bob Creek. And he looked at this Huckleberry Ridge top and he's like, this isn't anything like the Huckleberry Ridge top. So we age dated it and it turned out to be Lava Creek Top. So instead of the oldest eruption, the youngest uh, caldera forming eruption. And so the kind of implications of this are that the Lava Creek Top, we apparently can't even fully recognize, that there's more units to this eruption that we never fully appreciated previously. And so this project is going to um, kind of work really nicely with the map and that we need to remap this area and understand kind of where these rocks are. But then we also need to go back into the Lava Creek Top, which really a lot of the work in Yellowstone at this point has been age dating and maybe a little isotope work, which just tells you about the sources of stuff, but not really the petrology, not the temperature, the pressure, the storage. Is it multiple bodies? Were they all coming out at once or were they separated by time? And so that's the kind of questions we're hoping to dive into with the Lava Creek Top. So with that, I will thank you and answer any questions that you might have on the LSA as long as it doesn't have to do with one of the super options. Hi. I'm just curious about sort of the cross moving over. Um, yeah. Like and how does that? How do you envision that might change? Stay, yeah, change or stay intact or. That's a good question. So the question is, how does the tiramisu magma chamber change as the crust is moving? And so essentially, it's a very slow movement, right? So it's about the same rate actually as the methyl fluid coming up, which I think is interesting. And so there is a lot of work now being done with numerical modeling, like if we inject at this rate into the crust, how long does it take to build something with the plate moving? And so I think a lot of people kind of feel like you can only situate in some area and build that tiramisu model and sustain it for so long before you might then pause. Because one of the things that's really noticeable about the Snake River Plain is there's always these kind of big gaps, uh, I would say, between where each subsequent cold air forming eruption happens. And so the idea is that at one point you must move far enough away that you kind of close off the feeder and you're having it built the next one. And so I think that. They, that you do have this sweet spot of keeping that heat going and keeping those melt bodies actually melt and not crystallizing. And, and at one point, you know, I think it might be like here you're starting, here it's in full bloom, and here you're closing it, and then you start again. But I don't have any like map to follow them up. Can, can I just add something to that too? Yeah. I think there's a there's a common misconception that that 500 kilometer deep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is the magma chamber and it's not it's just it's a it's that solid basically from yeah. Cooper and Yuan's work that solid it's just a little bit warmer than the surrounding mantle and that's the hot spot that brings the heat mm -hmm. but it's not the magma it's not like this big magma pipe yeah, going yeah. down 500 kilometers yeah and then as the crust moves over that then that that extra heat gives you the term it's which I the love tiramisu. That, that. yeah no I'm bigger than tiramisu um yeah definitely I think one of the cool things to think about though is that essentially you're going to hit the bear tooth next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Really thick crust, so it's going to change everything. Yeah. You showed earlier the um, map and uh, check these, uh, you know, youngish wildlife finds inside the mm -hmm. caldera. On that map, you had some things that you said were outside the caldera. Yeah. Right. Are those, what's the age of those? Of the flows or yeah, the, the flows that are outside the caldera? A lot of them are still with between the Lava Creek Tough forming, so they actually are post that caldera forming. So okay. they're, they're still in that age group. So there's a lot of activity between like 170,000 years, and I think they're within that time period. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the zone of minerals that you showed. Yeah. So, uh, so your profiles suggested diffusion, yeah. But it, could can't some of that zoning be growth zoning? Totally, big problem. So essentially, <laughs> big problem in the field of mineral, like using these. But essentially, what you have to do is use multiple diffusion species. So something that would diffuse quicker versus something that's very slow diffusion, and you base what that initial profile looks like on the slowest diffuser, which could be then growth. 
you assume that's your starting profile. So instead of assuming a step function, mm -hmm. you might assume something that's more relaxed and then and then maybe model other things from that profile. But it hasn't always been the case and people have made, there's a lot of errors still coming out of these because we don't fully understand diffusion. Coupled element diffusion is the new thing that people are really misinterpreting. So for instance, like lithium is going to be limited by how much like aluminum or silica might be in certain things. And so there's a lot of error still associated with it. But if you use multiple diffusive species, it helps. Yeah, Andrew. Um, awesome talk. And uh, that was a sweet field trip that we got to go on. That's true. I should have, you were in one of those photos. Uh, I think so. <laughs> um, is there any trend that's observed between the surface deformation and earthquake storms? Just one Ooh, or two the other? I do not know the answer to that. I can ask about that. I don't know how you know the answer. It's a good question. I mean, you would assume that with deformation, a lot of the earthquakes are kind of thought to be associated a little bit with the bulging. And so if the bulging, you would you would think that they would be related. But I think a lot of the swarms um, might not be fully related. The time scales are slightly different. but. They're probably linked in some kind of way. Nor, you know, you show the, the, the thing the Norris had a lot of earthquakes and yeah. there was a lot of surface deformation. So they're probably linked. They seem like they should be linked. It's a good question for my phone, though, so do you know? Yeah. To be honest, I'm completely clueless on volcanoes. I've only taken one geology class here. Okay. Um, but I guess, like, I'm doing this for extra credit for a climate change class. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I guess you kind of touched upon that. And like, obviously, I understand like the whole gas emissions and things mm -hmm. like that would obviously change it. But is there anything that like fits in connection or any theories or ideas of how the current changes mm -hmm. are affecting volcano activity or anything? Oh, that's like that? good. So the only, um, so essentially, yeah, when, when volcanoes erupt, CO2 will be released, which will warm but also sulfur dioxide is released, which will cool. And sulfur dioxide lasts longer in the atmosphere. So the net, net result of big eruptions is actually cooling rather than warming. Currently, a lot of areas of the world are warming, uh, that the biggest effect for volcano is if you lose ice. And so by the deep, the depressurization associated with ice melt will actually allow for eruptions to be more prone to being triggered, the depressurization of the system. And so what they find is that after ice ages or around the time um, of, the, of ice leaving the system after an ice age, there's higher numbers of volcanic eruptions, which is well shown in like Chile, actually. Is that because of like the CO2 that's trapped? In no, it's actually, ice, so like if you imagine if you, pre if you put a bunch of pressure on something and down here, you know, let's say it's a balloon, right? And so if you take that off, that's going to let the balloon rise up. And so typically what will happen is if you remove ice, you actually allow some of that pressure to, to like pop a little bit. And so it causes more volcanic eruptions because you have less confining pressure on the system. Thank you. No problem. All right. Well, we've got our hand higher. Thank you very much.